Hey guys and gals, I'm Andy Asher. I'm editor over here at uh, bloomerboomer.com. Now September is just a huge month at Bloomer Boomer as we uh, as we kick off the first full season of new shows with amazing guests, celebrity hosts, thought leaders, authors, and visionaries who share breakthrough messages and discoveries for all of us over 55. And all the shows are live like today. They are open for your questions. If you prefer to binge watch though at your own convenience, simply uh, visit your favorite host's webpage at bloomerboomer.com. And today we are going to uh, kick it all off with an amazing guy. His name is Dr. Gregory Hammer, who has experienced all that life has to give and take it away as well. He has written an unforgettable book to help others make the best of what life has to offer. In addition to, to what he has done uh, as an author, uh, Dr. Hammer is a pediatric physician and Stanford professor. Now his book is the acronym GAIN, okay? Now we'll can deconstruct the meaning of that in just a moment or two. Uh, the title, Gain Without Pain, uh, has been described as a toolbox to conquer our, our walls of internal and external struggle. Um, you know, in a moment, we are going to uh, talk to Dr. Greg Hammer. Now, if you want to know more, let us know by joining Bloomer Boomer on the website. You know, like and follow us on your on your favorite uh, social media channel where we live stream on Facebook and YouTube and Twitter, even Twitch my favorite, Instagram, and here, right here at bloomerboomer.com. And now in the meantime, we'll hear from Dr. Greg Hammer with Gain Without Pain in a moment. But first, please do remember that I do love marmalade. Well, Greg Hammer, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so excited to explore the lessons in your book. Thank you very much, Andy. Always great to be with you. Well, now, today's topic is um, what you call burnout uh, drivers and solutions. Now, I want to get to that in just a moment. My first question is, and one I will certainly understand if you want to say, let the readers find out when they, they buy the book. So, uh, with that said, why gain without pain? Uh, why did you write it? You know, one might mistakenly believe that a highly educated doctor and professor are, you know, are protected from what life throws at us. Can you talk about that just a little? Well, I, I don't think that we in medicine are, are protected from uh, the stressors that the greater population experiences. I, I think really all of us are much more alike than we are different, regardless of our, our chosen field. Um, I, uh, practice pediatric intensive care medicine and pediatric cardiac anesthesia. And in these areas, we frequently encounter very desperate, very sad situations where uh, babies and children uh, may be at the end of their life. And uh, I realized very soon in my career that I needed a strategy to deal with that and that I really needed to face my own mortality if I was gonna deal with the mortality of others. Um, nevertheless, dealing with very sick children and their families is, is obviously quite challenging. And there's a lot of stress involved. And um, this is true not only of we physicians in those areas, but also the nurses, uh, uh, respiratory therapists, uh, social workers, other healthcare personnel. Uh, but the stresses that we experience in medicine are, are really fundamentally similar to the stresses that all of us experience. I think we're all stressed out by worry of our own mentality, uh, mortality, excuse me. We are all obsessed with thoughts of the past. Uh, and with those thoughts often comes shame and regret, remorse, because we are very hard on ourselves. Uh, and we're also obsessed with thoughts of the future, and that brings fear and anxiety. So I think that regret, shame, fear, anxiety are stressors that we all feel, regardless of uh, whether we're at home, at work, uh, pretty much at all phases of life. And the object in order to achieve greater resilience and happiness is to learn to be more present. 
because it's really in the present moment that we find happiness. If we think of all the happy moments we've had, they're when we are very present, not, not concerned about the past or future, but exactly right here, right now. So uh, back to your question as to why I got into this and, and how that evolved, I've had a longstanding wellness practice, I would say, meditation, physical fitness, diet. Uh, I have a degree in nutritional science and, and I've always been very interested in nutrition. And uh, I started getting very involved in our wellness program at Stanford, uh, our WellMD program for physicians. And then uh, I got invited to speak about this uh, and pretty much the speaking engagements took on a life of their own. And I was traveling around the United States and around the world talking about wellness. And then I had some sabbatical time and uh, I have a busy laboratory. I, I, I didn't feel as though I could leave town easily. So I thought, what can I do on my sabbatical? And all the arrows were really pointing in the direction of spreading the message uh, about which I had been speaking. And uh, writing a book just seemed like the natural way to do that. Um, I'm a intensive care physician and anesthesiologist. And so uh, we try to mitigate or preclude pain in our patients. And the expression, no pain, no gain came to mind. And I thought, well, it doesn't really have to be that way. And I sort of flipped that on its head. And the, the phrase gain without pain popped up. And uh, this evolved into the acronym, as you mentioned, for GAIN. GAIN stands for gratitude, acceptance, intention, and non-judgment. And I really believe that those are the pillars of resilience and happiness. Yeah. We're uh, going to talk about burnout today. And, and, and when we face the idea of burnout, our own personal resilience becomes front and center. Yeah. Boy, I'm 72. Now, you look so young, but you've learned a lot of life's lessons, it looks like, huh? Yes, I think so. I, I think that life is uh, joyful and also difficult and full of suffering for all of us. It, yeah. It's it's both. And, um, you know, I've been through a divorce. Uh, I had my son pass away three years ago. Uh, I've lost patience. Um I've blamed myself. Uh, if only I had known what was going on with uh, an occasional patient here and there a bit earlier, maybe I could have saved them. So, you know, I think that uh, we all have our tragedies in our lives. Um, we all struggle with the fact that life appears to have a beginning and an end. And we're all consumed by negative thoughts especially when we are stuck in the past and the future. So uh, yes, I've had my share of lumps and bumps and, uh, and that has really underscored the importance of resilience, Andy, and, and that's really the theme of my book. You know, you said that you talked about no pain, no gain, and I've heard that all my life and you know, you're making so much more sense because <clears throat> to a point, there's some truth to that, I think. But it doesn't have to be the, the guiding force that, that makes us move forward. It doesn't have to always be painful. Uh, no. I, that makes sense to me. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, I think in particular, when we think about resilience, um, the question arises, how can we take easy steps, small steps, but repeat them frequently and make progress without experiencing a lot of pain and without putting forth great effort. And I think that sometimes people have tried meditation, for example, and uh, they somehow felt that they were supposed to sit, comf sit uh, without moving in a particular position for 20 or 30 minutes and also uh, sit without having any thoughts in their head for that period of time. And that is simply too painful a bite or too big a bite. So I, I emphasize very small Bites. The meditation practice that my book promotes is really as little as a three minute daily practice. And, and the issue is really learning by repetition, but in small, painless bites, as it were. Boy, and so I think that's the application of uh, gain without pain. Yeah. And, 
you you put pain in in relation to meditation and you know i think that's the very thing that's probably kept me away from adopting and understanding it because it's hard for me to sit there that long and try to you know keep my mind totally blank uh, that's probably not exactly what you're saying but that's sort of sort of how i've interpreted it yes no i think you you uh, you nailed it um that's why many people try meditation as a as a tool for becoming more present more resilient and happier, but they feel as though they've failed. And that actually is, you know, is painful. You know, when we, when we try to apply ourselves to uh, an important endeavor and we believe that we fail, that's just another issue for which to blame ourselves and, and for us to be self-critical. So um, the game meditation that uh, I describe and promote in the book is, is really starting out as just a three minute practice. And, Rather than try to empty your mind of all thoughts, the idea is to guide yourself through a series of thoughts uh, while being focused on your breath at the same time, which is sort of the basis for most types of meditation. But the idea is to guide yourself through thoughts of gratitude, um, acceptance, which means that we know there's pain and suffering in our lives and in the world, but we can open our hearts to it and accept it intention, meaning that we can rewire our brains and instead of this negativity bias, have more of a positive, upbeat way of looking at the world and ourselves. And the end in game is non-judgment. And, and we'll talk about this in more detail, uh, I think in future sessions that we have together, Andy. Yeah. But basically the idea is that we're always judging everything, including ourselves as good or bad. and you know, we'll explore that and, and examine why we do that and, and whether or not it's truly necessary and to our benefit. So let's get into it. What, uh, what are burnout drivers and solutions? First of all, burnout is uh, exhaustion, both physical exhaustion, emotional, psychic exhaustion that results from stress. And the stress can seem as though it's external or internal and we're all as as we discussed we're all subject to a great deal of stress especially now during the pandemic um it's just a horrifically stressful time for most of us uh, for a variety of reasons um, whether we've lost our job whether we are uh going crazy sheltering in place at home and and missing the interaction with friends and family uh, there's just a whole host of, of very stressful circumstances related to this pandemic. And um, so it's very common to see people stressed out or burnt out, uh, especially, especially now. So, you know, drivers of burnout would include uh, all the factors that it, one can associate with the pandemic, being isolated, um, and our thoughts tend to go to the future with fear and anxiety. How long will this pandemic last? When will I be able to go back to work or get a gainful employment, in fact? And so it's just an extremely stressful time. So I think right now that's probably the biggest driver of burnout. But even uh, outside the concerns related to the pandemic, you know, we, we have worries uh, about the future, about whether we're gonna be able to put bread on the table, uh, what's happening next. Even when times are pretty good, we tend to project forward and, and wonder how long it's gonna last and, and when can things get even better. And then again, we're stuck in thoughts of the past as well. So I think the failure to be present, our natural obsession with the past and the future and our negativity bias are the generic sort of drivers of burnout. Yeah. Um, and they all point to solutions. That is, we don't have to be stuck in the past or the future. We can learn to be more present. We don't have to have this negativity bias. We can use our intention, and that's the I and game, to rewire our brains and, and change this negativity bias that we have. You know, we all have a lot of negative thoughts. We tend to grasp onto those negative thoughts, those painful thoughts, and, and we don't remember the good times and the good thoughts that we have. And so 
that's another driver of burnout is our negativity bias. You know, when I uh, first started reading your book, I uh, wanted to reflect back to my first uh, experience of burnout. And it was after I was after uh, being in college for so long, I just had to get out. And uh, it, it was a, a feeling of, of burnout. At least that's how it was for me. Now, you know, in the end, wouldn't you say, though, your, your book is about happiness, like uh, like the Deepak uh, Chopra quote, uh, the, the ultimate uh, goal of all of us is happiness. If you want to be happy, uh, make someone else happy, which uh, I think you're probably uh, doing in, in, in your book. Well, I hope so. I, I actually have that Deepak quote in my book when we talk about uh, what happiness is, why we don't have more of it, um, how we can get more of it. And I think we'll talk about that in a future session, Andy. Um, but as Deepak would, would confirm, I mean, that's really all that all 7 billion of us on the planet want is we all want to be happy. That's what we have in common among other things. And, and, and so I think it's worth really getting ourselves on the path toward greater resilience and happiness. And, and we can do that. That's the good news. That's right. That's right. Uh, that's that's uh, the hope that we have when we uh, try to make ourselves better. You know, episode one uh, in Burnout Drivers and Solutions, um, you know, you're talking, you've talked a little bit about burnout drivers and it has kind of a, a, a techie sound to it, but burnout is on the rise as we see in all the news accounts, this is a problem that, you know, we can't afford to ignore the, the rising cost of burnout or staggering, you know, healthcare professionals sacrifice their health and happiness and relationships and, and maybe uh, not so acutely as, phys as physicians, but, you know, all of us may have moments of the same emotions where were you surprised to discover, you know, the depth of the problem? Uh, I don't know that I was, uh, I, I've been surprised by the depth of the problem. I think it's, it's long, long since been, been recognized in my life as kind of the human condition. And, uh, you know, I studied Buddhism in, uh, at university and, uh, you know, one of the primary tenets of Buddhism that, that this life that we lead, this mortal existence is full of suffering. It's only when we can let go of our grasping to material things and ideas that are associated with us feeling a sense of separation, that we're a separate self. Only when we really let go of that can we be uh, freed of suffering and, and the concept of nirvana follows as opposed to this constant cycle of samsara where we're um, undergoing these cycles of suffering. So that's something that I, I, I have appreciated since I was quite young. And, um, and then being in the, the areas of medicine that I am, uh, suffering has been kind of front and center because I deal with so many sick children and their families. And uh, so it doesn't surprise me that, that we all suffer to the extent that we do. I think that uh, the good news is that we can do something about it and it doesn't have to be painful. Yeah. Now, so your book, Gain Without Pain, The Happiness Handbook for Healthcare Professionals, now that actually can be well adapted to practically everyone. The lessons in the book, you know, could be applied no matter what you do. Uh, you, you don't have to be a healthcare professional, in other words. That's true. Uh, there is a second book coming out, which is going to be more of a pocketbook version, which is called Gain Without Pain, Your Happiness Handbook. And then... Uh, Going forward, I, I, make, I would like to team up with others in various specialty areas outside of medicine, and, and we can have the Game Without Pain, the Happiness Handbook for teachers, for young parents, uh, for Wall Street, Silicon Valley, et cetera. But you know, I think that 90% of this message is very portable to all aspects and all fields of life. I do agree, and uh, you know, Greg, if you if you have just a couple of minutes, I just want to get uh, some of our frequently asked questions uh, that uh, maybe you could add some insight to. Uh, does that sound good, Greg? 
Of course. We'll be right I'll back. I'll take a stab at, at, at any question. All right. Okay, Greg, so this, uh, this comes from Carl. He feels burned out with his marriage. He says he is trying to reignite the flame, but he's, uh, he's having some problems. Now, I know you're not a psychologist, but maybe some of these things may apply to some of the lessons that, uh, that you've learned and share. I think so. I, I would actually go back to the GAIN rubric uh, I mean, there are a lot of approaches to marital issues. Uh, I've just been reading about the work of the Gottmans, which I find really interesting. Um, you know, they claim that they can sit with a couple for a minute or two and determine whether or not they're bound for success or not in their relationship. But, you know, I think that going back to the GAIN acronym, uh, I would I would first think of all the positive things in a relationship. And this can be with a spouse or a significant other or a dear friend or a family member, for example. There are a lot of good things that we experience in relationship. And one of them is at times when we're feeling very close to somebody, uh, as we might experience when being in the presence of a great work of art or listening to a timeless piece of music, we lose a sense of separation. And it, again, this is sort of Buddhist doctrine or Advaita doctrine, but when we feel as though we're really separate, a separate self is when we feel suffering. And so I think that applies in a marriage as well. And one approach would be to, first of all, just contemplate all the good things about this relationship, whether they're in the present or past elements of the relationship, times when we felt really close and uh, whether it's through our physical relationship or otherwise, when we've really lost a sense of separation and we think of all the wonderful things about our partner and, and let's kind of focus on the gratitude we experience for those good things. Uh, the A in gain is acceptance. And, you know, we are well aware that there's a lot of pain and suffering in the world. And we ourselves experience a great deal of pain and suffering, but Part of the gain meditation is as we sit and get in touch with our breath, we go through our gratitude, we go through our acceptance, and uh, we all have difficulties in our life, whether it's a difficult marriage, loss of a loved one. And so we can actually feel this painful experience. And rather than try to suppress it or resist it, we sit and we actually can visualize opening our chest and opening our hearts and bringing this suffering closer and closer until we really merge with it. And we sit with that in that state with our breath and contemplate that acceptance, total acceptance. And so I think this can be applied to the issues of suffering in a marriage and any relationship. And then we go to our intention and, you know, we tend to see the negative in things, including our marriage, our relationships with others. And we can realize through this gain process that this negativity bias that we have can be changed. We can actually start to think of things we're grateful for, think of things that are positive elements in our marriage, for example. And then the end and gain is non-judgment. And in this case, when it comes to marriage or, or a, a loving relationship or a relationship that has been loving, but doesn't feel so at the present time, let's not judge it. Let's not call it good or bad. This is not a good marriage or a bad marriage. It's just what it is. And let's not judge our partner. Let's not judge ourselves. Let's just sit with our, our relationship and, and, consider it just simply as it is in the same way we look at the world and we don't have to assign labels of good and bad to everything in the world. Things in the world are just as they are. We didn't cause it to be that way. We're not going to cure it or change it significantly. So, you know, when it comes to relationships, again, I would advocate consideration of these gain elements, be grateful for the good things that you have now and you have had with this person 
the loss of a sense of separation during the best of times when you felt truly present together, accept the limitations, don't dwell on them, but, but don't ignore them or try to push them away and accept the fact that we're all imperfect and our relationships therefore must be imperfect. Use yeah. our intention to yeah. really kind of get through the negativity bias we have that's applied to our relationships and everything else in our lives and, and rewire our brains to start to think of what we have rather than we don't, what we don't have. And then finally, you know, try to let go of judgments of our partner and ourselves. And so again, baby steps, this is not, you know, we, we have gotten into an unhappy relationship over a period of time, years in most cases. And so we're not going to change it in 15 minutes, but let's start taking baby steps toward looking at life, looking at our partner, looking at ourselves a bit differently through this game process. Wow, that could uh, save a few relationships, I would say. Th this next question is from Beth. It's probably uh, similar to what you're talking about uh, in, with, in the medical world. She, uh, this is Beth. She's, uh, she's been a teacher now for nearly a dozen years, and she, she still loves all the reports. And, uh, but it's the, um, you know, she, she loves teaching, but it's all the reports, she, uh, she says. And that she calls the teacher police have made uh, made the job less fun. Uh, she says that she doesn't know really how to break out of her funk right now. That's... Well, you know, this is this is the case in medicine as well. It's a, the administrative burden has become greater and greater over time. Uh, one of the drivers of burnout in healthcare is uh, the electronic medical record, for example, which, like many other technologic advances represents some really positive things, but also some very negative things. And it, it does, using the electronic medical record, does drain more of our time, um, makes it easier for take, uh, to take work home and just uh, get on our computer and access our electronic medical record platform. And that's the good news and the bad news is that it lengthens our day. We tend to take work home and this erodes into time with our family. So I, I, I feel very empathetic for teachers because that's something that I've heard over and over again is the administrative burden is just oppressive. And I, I think that's the case in, in many fields. So first of all, that teacher is not alone. Um, this is something that I think many of us experience. Yeah. And, uh, the stresses associated with being a teacher are tremendous, uh, including not only the administrative aspects, but uh, dealing with families, the expectations that families have of their child's teachers. And um, I know this can be extremely oppressive. And I think there are a lot of parallels between being a teacher and being a physician, because you're, you're actually taking care of your patients or your students and their families uh, in much the same way. So again, um, I, would, I would refer back to the gain process, and that is to, you know, do a gain meditation every day, and then you can choose which elements on that particular day that you're going to focus on. So today I'm going to be grateful. I'm going to start with one uh, consideration of gratitude. Uh, when I first get into my classroom, I'm going to look out at my students and I'm just going to be so grateful that I've got these beautiful, open, malleable, bright young minds in front of me and, and how grateful I am that I have the privilege of being able to really make uh, a difference in their lives through my skills and through my interactions with them and their families. So focus on gratitude for the wonderful things about the teaching profession and they are numerous. And then accept uh the, the the problems i mean acceptance means not apathy or being laissez-faire but rather discerning between things we can change and things we cannot change and those things that we cannot change we really must accept so uh to to some degree there are things that you can't change that are stressful about being a teacher and i would sit with those rather than resist them um you know there's a a, a formula in my book uh, suffering equals pain times resistance. So the pain is there, but the more we resist it, the greater our suffering. 
And so we do have to learn to accept and let go of resistance and uh, easier said than done. But basically, if we apply the game principles, small bites, we can gradually look back over the past three or six months since we've been embracing this practice and see that we've really made progress. So accepting some of the administrative burden and, and the other issues with uh, being a teacher, um, but using our intention again to, to rewire our brains instead of focusing and, and dwelling excessively on the things we don't like about being a teacher, really starting to see what we have and not what we don't have and, and what we enjoy about it rather than focusing on what we don't enjoy about it. Yeah. And, uh, and then non-judgment as with everything else comes into play. Let's not judge the system or ourselves. So this is a challenge, but small bites, daily practice. And, you know, I think we can all make a lot of progress in terms of becoming more resilient and happier with our work, because there is a lot to enjoy about being a teacher, undoubtedly. And I think something you said earlier that applies is living for the moment. Absolutely. I think we can all agree that when we think about the times when we're most happy, it's when we're truly present, you know, taking a walk in the woods. Um, many of our happy times are in when we're in nature because we're amidst these tall trees, for example, and they don't know anything about our stressors and, you know, they don't care. Um, they're beautiful, they're majestic, and we look at the world around us differently when we're in a natural setting and we feel present. We stop holding on to these thoughts of the past and the future that bring us shame and fear and anxiety. And we tend to let that go. And really what we're doing is just experiencing the overwhelmingly moving presence of, of the forest in that case. And so, yes, I think bringing ourselves to the present moment intentionally on purpose, as John Kabat-Zinn said, this is really the foundation of mindfulness is, is, being present with deliberation, with intention, on purpose, without judgment. And we're all capable of, of looking at the world and ourselves in that way. Yeah, presence, that, that makes sense. Uh, Greg, I don't want to keep you away too long. I know you've got other things to do. I want to, uh, I, what I want to do is uh, let people know what's going on uh, for next week. Also, uh, help people can uh, find your book and get it in touch with you. So just hang on and we'll get right back uh, with, with Greg. Okay, Greg, next week uh, we are going to uh, be talking about uh, happiness. How do we get more of it? That sounds like a good one. And uh, what generally are we going to be talking about in that, that general topic area? Andy, as, as we've discussed, uh, it's the, the thing that all 7 billion of us on the planet want is, is happiness. And we've talked about some of the issues with burnout, the flip side, I suppose, is, is happiness. You know, that is when we let go of the stressors in our lives and, and let go of considerations of the past and the future, we become happier. And uh, interestingly, we, we often resist those things that we know lead to happiness. So we'll talk a little bit about why that is and uh, what the elements of happiness truly are. And, they're accessible to all of us. It's actually our true nature is happiness. And unfortunately that true nature is veiled by our minds. And uh, the good news is we don't really have to look very far to find happiness, it's within us. So uh, I'm looking forward to having that discussion with you, Andy. Absolutely, me too, me too. And where can people learn more about you and your book, uh, Gain Without Pain? I know that uh, and, and that it, you have uh, a couple of websites. We have a website for you too. But I'll show folks what that looks like and you can tell us a little bit more about that. Yes, well, there's uh, the Dr. Greg Hammer uh, Facebook site and uh, my other website, which has a lot of recordings and uh, of interviews and podcasts and so on, as well as uh, a link to Amazon where the book can be purchased, is greghammermd.com. That's one word, G-R-E-G-H-A-M-M-E-R-M-D.com. 
So, uh, you know, thank you for bringing that up, Andy. I hope that people will access the site and, and, and have a look at the contents. And they can also buy it at the site they're seeing right here at bloomerboomer.com slash uh, Gregory Hammer. So uh, you can check that out there. Um, hey, Greg, uh, fantastic. Look forward to talking to you, uh, at you next week and uh, have a great week. Likewise, Andy. It's, it's always a great pleasure being with you. Absolutely. Well, uh, thank you again, Greg. We will be back here the same day, same time next week with uh, Dr. Greg Hammer, author of Gain Without Pain, the Happiness Handbook for Healthcare Professionals. You can find out more on Facebook and YouTube and at uh, here at bloomerboober.com. And by the way, if you uh, like this, please like us on Facebook and follow us. In the meantime, uh, we're going to see you next week, if not sooner. See you then.